Welcome back to another edition of the Hang Time Podcast. Yo, Sekou Smith here in Atlanta. My main man, John Schumann, is in New Jersey. John Hartzell's behind the glass, making it all work. Hope you're ready. We are ankle deep into the 2019 portion of the NBA calendar, and already we've got some good action and some good topics to discuss. Later on in the show, we'll be joined by Eric Woodyard of the Deseret News to talk about the Utah Jazz, who sit at 21-21 and 21 after a slow start to the season. Shoe, I know you were high on the Jazz in the summer. Not quite the Jazz team we were expecting. Before we get to the Jazz, another wild weekend. I mean, not wild Wednesday, excuse me, around the NBA. I'm on crunch time on NBA TV every Wednesday night. So I have to uh, contend with not only the, the wild action, but also Jerry Greenberg's wired up energy for that bit of league watching. Greg Anthony was with us as well. Shoe, the Bucks and Rockets gave us a really good preview, if you will, of two guys who could very well be in the in the crosshairs come MVP time. Giannis Antetokounmpo and the Bucks get the win on the road. Giannis was outstanding, 27 points, a career high, 21 rebounds. Malcolm Brogdon was great. James Harden kept his scoring rolling, 14 straight games with 30 or more points, tying Tracy McGrady behind Kobe Bryant for the league record. But the Rockets got exposed a little bit. I thought the Bucks did a really nice job forcing James Harden out of his comfort zone. I mean, he had 42 but he also, you know, I mean, so it's not like they shut him down. But he had, he also had nine turnovers and shot just 30, 13 to 30 from the floor. Did you think they revealed anything specific about how to maybe frustrate James Harden? As far as revealing something, I don't think you're ever going to be able to just guard James Harden one way and be successful. Like, he's going to figure it out. But they show, they, they, you know, for one night, you know, there's nights during the regular season when you can see how a team defends a guy like that. And if, if, if it's a little bit different than usual, you know, I, I'm sure every potential opponent for the Rockets looks that looks at that and takes that uh, takes notes and says, OK, maybe we'll defend him like that for a quarter at a time or a half at a time or one game in a series or something like that. Just to throw because you uh, with a guy like that, you've got to throw different looks at him. I mean, you're going to switch some. You're going to trap some. Um, you're going to try to force him right a lot. Some some. and you're going to put different defenders on him. And so when something like that happens, I'm sure everybody around the league takes some notes, but knows that you can't just one thing isn't going to work. And like you said, they, they maybe took him out of his comfort zone, but he still had 42, you said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, when you slow James Harden down, it's just, like I said, it's not about shutting him down. It's about trying to slow him down. He yeah, and It was still a relatively okay offensive game for the Rockets overall. But the other end of the floor is another story. I mean, and and I, we've said this on here before, and and I will repeat it, and it's because it's still true. The Bucks have yet to been to be outscored in the paint this season in any game, and part of that is their defense. But last night, the points in the paint were seventy to twenty four, yeah. and the Rockets had twenty four points in the paint by themselves uh, all together. Malcolm Brogdon eighteen points in the paint. Giannis Antetokounmpo sixteen points in the paint. You know, he's the the king. Yeah, but I think we got to look at Brogdon and realize that this dude is a really good player. You know, I think you know, uh, obviously his Rookie of the Year award was you know probably one of the weakest Rookie of the Year awards we've ever had. But that doesn't mean that this dude isn't a, a valuable player on a really good team, and he's having a really good season as well, shooting really well from three, but also getting to the paint. Um, I was looking at some some numbers of guards in the restricted area, and Bledsoe and Brogdon rank like fifth and sixth in restricted area points among guards. So it's right. not just when we talk about the Bucks at the basket, it's not just Antetokounmpo and his league, league leading points in the paint or points in the restricted area and dunks per game. It's also the other guys that are getting there. Um, and that's uh, those guys benefiting from the way this team spreads the floor uh, offensively. So like, you know, when they play five out and guys and they're in transition and guys run to the corner, that gives Bledsoe the opportunity, if he has the ball, to attack a guy in isolation or Brogdon to do the same or attack a closeout because there's nobody else and there's no – the, the defenders aren't in the paint. And and like I said, Brogdon's having a, a really, really good season. I was wondering if George Hill was going to start you know, over Brogdon when he came in, but they haven't, and I think they've been smart to, to keep uh, those guys together. Yeah. Are we convinced now, Shu, that the Bucks are a legitimate – I'm regretting a little bit moving him down in the power rankings uh, <laughs> this week. I, I still have a reasonable explanation for it, but I'll uh, right. 
Right. You know, I, I will strongly consider moving them back to number one or number two uh, right. on Monday. But I'm saying we are they're we legit are to the point now. They're, they're, this is not a fluke after a half a season of playing the, the way they have. This is legit now, right? Absolutely. I mean, they are top five on both ends of the floor, only team. That's top five on both ends of the floor. And that means a lot. And, you know, when it comes down to the Eastern Conference playoffs, it's going to be about matchups quite a bit. And we'll see, you know, who they get in the first round, who they get in the, the second round, who they get in the conference finals if they get there. But they have every, they have the tools. I mean, they have a defense that protects the basket. Um, and they have an offense that spreads the floor and doesn't just live off threes. I mean, it's score, they, like I said, they score, in, they score in the paint quite a bit. And I think um, – you know, we'll see how teams defend onto Tacumpo, but even if they play soft him, he's the guy that can take advantage of a uh, a soft defensive scheme, say more than a Ben Simmons can. You know, just because he just has that extra length and athleticism. Yeah, I do think we get caught up in this thing too, where we're always wondering, you know, about certain teams. Like, are, are, is what we're seeing from them legit? Like, is this team as good as we think they are? All that good stuff. I, I was sold early on the Bucks team shoe, but they've all they've done is make a believer out of me time and again. Like they keep reminding me that yes, Mike Budenholzer and what he's done, that the personnel they have and the way they play, it's legit. Like it's and I and I'm I'm appreciative of the fact that we were wondering what kind of league would we have, what kind of Eastern conference would we have in the vacuum that that is life after LeBron. In, in Cleveland and life with LeBron on the other side of the conference divide. This is impressive. I mean, what the Bucks have done, how they've done it, it's impressive to me. Just, you know, how quickly they've shifted, flipped everything, and put in place the kind of team that can challenge Boston or that can challenge, you know, Toronto or whoever else needs. And Boston's another team. Wednesday night, you know, those wild Wednesdays around the NBA, schedule makers have nailed it this year on Wednesdays. They put one on the Pacers. I mean – Mm-hmm. Lit up the Pacers. I think it's the the most points the Pacers have given up all season, and and they're the number one defensive team in the league in terms of points allowed. If I'm correct, they they got rolled by the Celtics last night, and that was interesting to see because Boston got big games from a lot of guys um, offensively. One who is a guy I think in Marcus Morris who's been underrated this season in terms of how consistently well he's played. But Kyrie didn't go bananas. It was it was the other guys. It was some of that supporting cast that that really did the job yeah i mean we know that the potential is there for boston to just be the best team in the east if they put it all together um and we've seen them put it all together on certain nights uh, last night obviously being uh the best case of, or the best example of that and yeah morris has <laughs> when all those other guys were struggling early on marcus morris was having himself a season and uh and you know he deserves a ton of credit for helping sort of keeping this team from being worse than it was uh, in the in that first month or two. We mentioned earlier that we were going to get Eric Woodard of the Deseret News on to talk about the Jazz. That's a team that I, I don't want to be cruel talking about the Jazz, but we certainly had a different set of expectations for the Jazz, and they don't appear to be in the right space right now as a team. They just have not found a way – to build on what we saw from them in the postseason last year. They've been inconsistent. It's been some ups and downs for Donovan Mitchell in his, you know, sophomore season. He's not the only second year guy who's experiencing some of those issues. But Eric has got a, a really good perspective on this team and has has been a guy who's dug up some different stories that I think uh, really shed a light on what's happening with this team. One of my favorite young beat writers around the league, man. Doesn't hurt that he's a Michigan native from Flint. That always helps. That always helps the cause. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, thank you. What's up, man? How you doing, man? I appreciate the kind of words, man. I appreciate y'all having me out here, man. Yeah, yeah, man. We appreciate it. Look, Shu was very high on Utah in, in in our preseason podcast, just kind of forecasting the league. I, was, I wasn't as high, but I was just challenging him to make sure he thought they were what he assumed they'd be. You know, it, I know a lot of people were talking top three in the West, a challenger in the West. I thought that was rich for a team that looked good last year at the end of the season and certainly into the playoffs. But I wasn't sure if they were built 
for, for what everybody was forecasting. Have they have they just fallen short of some really immense expectations, or is there maybe a miscalculation going on in terms of what we thought they'd be this soon? I think uh, it's been a it's been a mixture of, of a few things. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't understand, man. The Jazz, if you go on ESPN, um, look at their strength of schedule. They, they've had the toughest schedule in the league. So 25 of their first 42 games been on the road. You know, so I'm saying like that within itself has been tough. You know, and I think um, they came in, like you said, with a lot of expectations. And I think early on, Donovan was, I mean, he, he wouldn't say it, but I felt like he was putting a lot of pressure on himself. Obviously, you know, getting his first sneaker, uh, coming to all these yeah. different heightened expectations, endorsements. He's going to arenas now where people expected him, whereas last year, he kind of caught everybody by surprise. So, and I, and I actually talked to Kevin Durant about this. Most second year players haven't had that type of expectation to lead a playoff team. Yeah, to be great individually, but for him, to lead a playoff team and come back off that, you know, it was a, it was it was a different game for them. So now I think honestly, within these last like six games, they're like four and two. Um, the defense is playing a lot better. If you look at Donovan last four games, he's almost averaging twenty six points a game, uh, forty seven percent shooting, fifty three point eight percent from three. So the last, you know, four games he's been it's it's like he's been picking it, you know, getting it getting it together. But like you say, they were very, very inconsistent. Um and I think that's probably because of that schedule. I'm not blaming it on the schedule, but I think that it's just the heightened expectations. I think they need to figure things out, you know, as well. Because uh, they, they coming into the year where they was you know, they was catching people by surprise to so now you're being a hundred. And I think now, you know, they're adjusting to that and finding what made them great last year, which is defense, you know what I mean? And uh, they're getting back to the basics with that. Because, you know, at the beginning of the year, they weren't even that great defensively. So now they're fifth best in the, you know, got the fifth best defensive rating. And there's some holes to fix, but I feel like they are starting to turn that corner a little bit. Do you, do you feel like as well that, you know, when you're talking about Donovan being a young guy who you mentioned how much is on his plate now, and I could sense it coming in the playoffs last year when we were in Houston. He, it, you know, it was one of those star turns where the way he was going at at James Harden and the Rockets, <laughs> it was it was clear that people had not appreciated the talent, the depth of talent he had. Was was this a transformative summer for him, just mentally understanding that he was going to be on a different level this year in the league in terms of the way teams defended him, the attention he garnered from other teams, like you mentioned. We're going to be no more sneaking up on anybody or surprising right. anybody this year. Well, most, you know, I don't think most people know, you know, he didn't really get a lot of time to train this offseason. He got hurt his foot in that, you know, in that series versus, uh, versus Houston. And uh, he was out, man. He didn't really get a chance to train like that. So he didn't really get a chance to get much better than he was and get separation. You know, that offseason time, man, people don't understand. That's that's pivotal as far as, you know, not saying that he's not a hard worker, but he just he couldn't train his foot. He was in like a boot. You know, so during that time, that's when he kind of went around and, you know, on his, what they call it his media tour, you know what I mean? And kind of built his brand personally, but he wasn't able to train. So, I mean, I, I feel like he'll honestly take an even bigger leap, you know, I think this second half of the year and also really from year two to year three, you know, because like you say, people know his tendencies, this and that, and he didn't really have a lot of time to, you know, separate. So I think he knew and he wants to be great. I mean, he talked to this kid, man. He, he wants to be great. He's a student of the game. He stays out to practice a lot, you know, listen to, to, to the to the coaching staff. And, you know, I see that greatness in him, but I think it took him a while to adjust this year. And he knew what was coming, but it's the difference between knowing and actually going through it. And like I say, you look at these last, you know, four games or so, you know, he's been playing on another level last year. He had, I mean, last, last night he had 33 and seven assists. You know, this team is so much more better when he's not forced. I think I looked at his stat. It was 19 and six when he had six or more assists. So when he's, Making things happen and not taking it upon himself to try to, you know, take every big shot. You know, the team is so much more better. He's figuring it out. He's getting better as the year's going on. Eric, are they done with this, uh, that sort of a platoon experiment they were doing with Crowder in the starting lineup? I know, like, in December, they went a couple weeks where they sort of alternated Crowder and Favors. If you look at their lineups, like, the Crowder at power forward instead of Favors lineup is so much better but I guess they just feel like they have to give Favors those minutes at the start of games. What, what has been, uh, Quinn Snyder, what has he said about sort of that, that lineup dynamic and, and, and why did he ex- – first of all, why did he experiment with the sort of platooning of them and then why has he gone away from it and, and how does he feel about the sort of the favors go bear combo going forward? Yeah, so him, you know, Quinn is always, um, he's always, uh, he doesn't really like to get into the lineup questions, but we still, we press him about it, we ask him about it, you know, whenever we can, but he was saying that, you know, his thought process would be certain games, you know, would present certain challenges, so 
in this situation, he might see Jay Crowder better, but in another situation, he might see Derek Favors better. And I think a, a, a credit to both of those guys, and none of them guys let it hurt their ego. You know, they, they're team guys. You know, you know, a lot has been said about this team, but they, they really are a good team. So he was doing it based upon, you know, his thought process was just matchups and depending on what team they face. And lately you've seen him just settle in and use a Favors. And uh, I think Favors is uh, solid as a rock, man. He's just whatever role they need him to, to, to do, he steps into it to do. But, yeah, it was kind of weird to me as well that they were switching it up like that. But that was his explanation for it. I mean, he's the coach. I can only listen to what he's saying. But from watching it, you know, it was kind of weird at times because, you know, you didn't know who would start. But, like I said, they've been settling back into that starting lineup from last year. And I think it's really just because of Favors, his attitude, is, you know, and, and, and how he approaches things. And he's been there so long. So, I think partly was, you know, as a coach, you have to manage those egos as well. So, I mean, it's it's bigger than just, you know, the court, you know, the on-court thing. We might see Jay Crowder as actually being a better guy, but, you know, in that lineup. But uh, I think it's, it's a lot of political things as well, you know, with coaching and, and managing egos and things like that as well. I got another lineup question, actually, because now uh, Rubio is hurt. Exum is hurt. Maybe you can update us on, on how long those guys are going to be out. But I was just thinking, okay, they have uh, Raul Neto who can come in and, and, and play some point guard, but they also have the option of just playing Mitchell at point guard. But I realize they've only played like 75 minutes with Mitchell on the floor without any of those other three guys. I, I didn't realize how mm-hmm. few minutes they've played with him as the, as the lone sort of ball handler um, in the backcourt. Mm-hmm. And I know Ingles runs some pick and roll and, and handles the ball quite a bit, but I, I, I'm kind of fascinated. Like, what, what is the plan going forward with these two guys out and, and how much uh, sort of extra onus that puts on Mitchell as far as handling the ball? So, yeah, not only those two guys, man, you got Ricky Rubio, Todd Wilson-Felosha, both of those guys got mild right hamstring strains. They, they're, they're expected to be evaluated in a week. Dante Exum, left ankle sprain. He did that versus Detroit. You also got Tony Bradley, who's been mostly in the, in the, in the D League, you know, but he's out a month. He just had a right knee surgery. And Grayson Allen as well. He, he also got a right ankle sprain, so he should be back soon. But I think the the plan is just to uh, just to let Howell Little, you know, run the point guard. Last night, you know, it was the first time starting since he was a rookie. He had 10 points, 3 assists, 3 rebounds. And I think they're going to go with that. I feel like they feel comfortable, you know, with that. You know, until Rubio gets back, I mean, maybe maybe they might they might call up a guy or something from the G League, but I don't see them doing anything drastically. As far as with Mitchell uh, running point guard, I think um, he already has a lot to do. I mean, and we saw the other night when they played Milwaukee. You know, he started off so hot, man. He, he finished with 26 and he broke down in the stretch, and I think it was because he had to handle the ball so much more. You know, Rich Rubio actually that was a game where he uh, he strained his hamstring. Uh, within the first, you know, in the first quarter. And I think, you know, they're trying to relieve him from having to do so much. He already has to do a lot anyway. And that's one of the things I feel like the Jazz need is an, another scorer, you know, to help him out because he, he, he does have to do a lot as the primary focal point of the offense. So young. So I think they'll just ride it out with Howell Neto, see what happens, you know, over this next week or so and, until the guys get healthy. Because Dante Exum was playing in a great rhythm. You know, Ricky Rubio was in a great rhythm. They were starting to get together. So I, I think uh, they'll just ride it out with him and let him play point and, you know, let Donovan handle it here and there. But he's already – he has so much chance to do an offense already. So handling the ball full time was, you know, tough on him as well too. Yeah, and they, they need – I think they especially need him in the last few minutes of fourth quarter close games. You know, like I was in – Right. I was at the game in Brooklyn where it was a close game and then he just sort of took over in the fourth quarter – um, and put the mm-hmm. game away. I know last night he basically did the same. I think it was a couple games right. prior. I think he's had at least ten points in in, in the fourth quarter and two of the last three games. So yeah. they yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, he did. He, he, managing he did. Yeah. his 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 stress his uh the stress on him through the first three quarters is critical critical because when it comes down to fourth quarters, you need a dude who can just make something out of nothing, really, right? And right. he's got to be that right. guy. And like you say, you you saw that you saw that uh, in Detroit. You know, he took over. You know, in the fourth and second half. You know, yeah, twenty what twenty four of his twenty six in the second half. And then you know, like I say, that Milwaukee game when Rubio went down when it wasn't really a, a point guard. You know, other than him, he, he was like zero for five in the fourth. So like you say, managing those minutes is why I think you'll see how Neto pick up these minutes while Ricky Rubio and Dante X are out. Eric, we we got the the trade deadline moved up now before All Star Weekend. And we don't know how active things will be around the league. A lot of teams in the West are going to have to really evaluate what they have and whether or not they want to be buyers or sellers. Big test for the Jazz, obviously, against the Lakers tomorrow night on ESPN. Are they looking around at the landscape in the West, engaging whether or not they got to do something to to maybe jumpstart themselves even more? 
put themselves back in a in a better position? Or do you feel like the roster they have now, they feel pretty confident in when healthy, they'll be a, a competitive team on the level they want to be at? I feel like Dennis Lynch, you know, is going to feel like they're going to ride it out, man. I feel like they already feel like they got through the toughest stretch. You know, obviously I'm not a GM, I, you know, in the Jazz organization is very tight lit, you know, but I feel like they're going to ride it out. Like I said, they had the toughest schedule of 25 in the first 42 on the wall. You got to look at the next 11 to 14 are at home. You know, um, I think they'll make a run. I, I don't think it'll be like the last year when they went, you know, won 25 the last, what, 36. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I think it'll be similar to that. I think they're going to, you know, really – um really make a run in the second half of the year and I feel like it's starting to heat up. You can feel it, you know, like just from being around the team and, you know, Kyle Corver has been helping his team out a lot too since they got him. You know, the shooting right. percentage has been a lot better. They've been up to like 37%, you know, since they traded him for Alec Burks. Um, I think he's, he's very helpful not only on the court but in the locker room, you know, moving off the ball. He doesn't need to dribble that much, but I think they're going to ride it out this year. I think they'll definitely make a, you know, make it to the playoffs. I think they're in the ninth spot in the West right now. I, I can see them getting within the, within five. You know, that's my opinion, but, you know, things can change. But, yeah, I think I, I think things are going to change the second half of the year. They got through the brutal stretch, and, you know, we'll see the team play a lot better, you know, than, than what they did the first half. It's funny you talk about the urgency last night. I think last night where they're down 21. Uh, they were down, yeah, 21 down 21 to Orlando at home. You could tell, like, there must have been a, hey, if we're going to make the playoffs, <laughs> we can't be losing to this. <laughs> Sleeping team, you know, uh, realization right. at some point in that game, and then they uh, they basically flipped the switch. Right. Yeah. Definitely, man. Definitely, they definitely flipped the switch last night. And, you know, I think they they start slow a lot of games. I mean, that's that's one thing that they do need to you know get better at starting games a lot better. But they miss shooting. There's been many games where they shot below forty percent man in the first quarter and kind of turn it on after that. So you know that's. that's that's something that they need to work on as well. But like I say, now you got what five guys hurt man. So. He's just yeah. making it through this stretch and, you know, playing strong. But I, like I said, I feel like the defense is playing a lot better. I feel like Donovan is starting to figure things out as well, which is obviously he's the leader offensively. And, uh, you know, just, just the way he's attacking, if you watch, man, now he's learning when he gets in the basket not to go in with those wild layers. You know, trying to trying to uh, cut down on his many pulling up threes off the dribble, you know, with, you know, just not really thinking. I feel like he's thinking the game more now and it's starting to get – slower to him now, you know, that he's figuring things out. That comes from watching film, talking to Coach Snyder. You know, he's doing all the right things and Rudy Gobert is playing out his mind defensively right now. And uh yeah, yeah, I think I think I think they'll go on another big win in the second half. I, I really can't see them not, you know, not having a good second half so, you know, they stay working and, stay, and keep doing the things that they've been doing. Eric, let me ask you one last thing about the West and where the Jazz fits. You look at the top eight right now, you know, and, and Denver is a, I would say is a surprise being, you know, up there at the top of the standings. The Clippers, to me, are surprised, certainly being in the top four. Everybody else is pretty much a team you expected to be in that playoff mix, maybe except for the Spurs. Maybe we thought they would take a step back. Mm-hmm. If the Jazz make it, who has to come out? Like, who has to – whose spot do they snatch to get into yeah. the playoff? Yeah, I mean, like you said, that's that's the tough part right there. Man, who do, whose spot do they snatch? Yeah. Maybe the Clippers – I can't see the Clippers playing this. this that's just me. I, I don't see it. Um, mm. I see Denver definitely making it. Um, yeah. I would definitely – I would think, you know, possibly either, either the Clippers or maybe the Spurs. Mm. And I see the Lakers playing a lot better once LeBron gets back as well. I think right. they're, in, they're in eight right now. So, my, that would be my guess. But I, I think Denver is going to continue to play well. Not, I don't think number one, you know, but, you know, if I see them getting a spot, I would say the Clippers or, or, or Spurs. Okay. Because I, I just wonder – I. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. That's what I, a lot of people been asking about that as well, too. So, yeah, I mean, they're they right there, man. I mean, they're in number, they, mm-hmm. they ninth right now. But it's going to be tough, man. It's not going to be easy. You know, and, and, <laughs> right. and games, you know, games, you know, games back is separated by, you know, so few, man, half a game where, you know, one game can really dictate what, you know, where you at, just like it was last year, how close to, yeah. you know, the West played out. So, yeah, I, I just think with how, how their schedule, you know, plays out this second half, I think that that's going to play a, a major factor because, like I say, that first half, man, I mean, they, they had a brutal stretch. You know, and they played some really, really tough teams, man, especially on the road, too. So, yeah, and, and they were figuring things out. And, you know, I, I just see them playing a lot better. From a from a DNA standpoint, they, they do have the mate, what you need, though, right? They got the DNA to to kind of get back in that zone they were in last year and, and I, I come think playoff so. time. Yeah. But, you know, if they really want to take their championship, you know, get, get in a real conversation for the championship, at some point they're going to have to have another score or, you know, either try to trade for another score or have another guy just step up consistently, you know, because it's, it's just so much pressure on Donovan, man. Like, 
you know, being a young guy offensively. I need another guy that can score 13 or 14 every single night. You know, they step on the court, you know, outside of outside of Donovan that can create a shot or, you know, do something when he's, you know, so he to relieve the pressure on him, that's just moving forward. But I think this year for sure they have to make up the DNA. I mean, they're tough-minded and they play defense. You know, they, they I was talking to, you know, the uh, – with, with Dennis Lindsay and Coach Snyder, and, you know, they were, they were telling me they want to be, you know, in the mold of those Pistons teams, you know, from when they were going to work, you know, how we know from Michigan. <laughs> you know, they yeah. kind of want to be yeah. in that mold. That's what they're trying to be in the, in, the, in the time now where so many super teams. So, you know, they're approaching defense seriously, man, and they want to be their mark in that way. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, everybody is not going to be able to put together a super team. And we know in a, in a city like Salt Lake City, it's going to be tougher to attract right. that kind of super team. So Definitely. they, they got to have a, a, a counterpunch method to building right. that team, man. We appreciate you. Look, Schumann always has a stat for us on Thursdays. I'm not smart enough to get the answers right by myself. So <laughs> the guest is obligated to, to help out with, with a trivia stat this week. Schumann, what's, what's the Schumann stat this week, man? We're going to double team this thing from the glove. All right. I was looking at the uh, Jazz numbers. The Jazz have uh, six guys averaging double figures in scoring, five starters plus uh, Jay Crowder. So I was just sort of looking at different teams, and there's 150 players that have averaged double figures uh, in at least 20 games this year. So that's an average of five per team. But there are two teams that are in playoff position that only have three guys averaging double figures. So who are the two teams currently in playoff position that with only three guys on the roster who have averaged double figures? Uh, now, is this a, this is a league-wide question, or this is not just the West, right? Correct. League-wide? Yeah. I would say Houston, probably. Nope. Houston, not one? Uh, nope. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> Houston has... Wait a minute. I know this. I, I, know I guess this. four guys. If uh, Harden, Capella, Gordon, and Chris Paul. And if all, yeah. all average double figures. And then Austin Rivers is there, too. He'll get there at some point. Yeah. I was I was doing my report, uh, you know, the midseason report cards, and I, I remember looking at somebody's stats and being shocked that they didn't have more guys averaging double figures. Um, it's a league-wide question, but both teams are in the West. I'll give you that hint. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would. I would imagine. Do you think teams that are top heavy as far as guys that? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like top heavy. Yeah. Yeah, but they got to be in the playoff mix. That's the yep. other thing. Um, Oklahoma City. Nope. No, I, I know no. it's not Oklahoma City. And the Spurs, I thought would be one, but they got four. Um, and who was it? I was <laughs> Portland. Portland, yes, is one. Yeah, Portland. Yeah, Portland. Portland was one. That's right. Yes. Portland Trail. Yeah, they got Lillard, Lillard McCollum, and Nurkic. Right? McCollum <laughs> and Nurkic. Aminu is next yeah, at nine nine point four points per game. Right. Um, and they they play a you know a slower pace and and they rank eleventh offensively. This other team right. is a much is a better offensive team, actually a much better offensive team than the, the Blazers. Mm-hmm. Should be fairly easy. Come on. Listen, man. There, this team's okay. points per game are 28.9, 28.4, 21.6, and then 7.6 is the fourth guy. So three guys averaging 20, and then nobody else averaging double figures. Golden State. Golden State, correct. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I wouldn't Curry, have that. Curry, Durant, and Thompson, and then fourth on Golden State in scoring is – Quinn Cook, right? Quinn Cook, yes. Yeah, until they get a, until they get Boogie back, <laughs> they won't have a really a four, you know, a get Boogie in the lineup. Yeah. They won't. Have, yeah. And Draymond has Dray- played. Draymond Green, seven point three points per yeah. game. You know, Iguodala yeah. five and change. Jarebko. I think I, I think mean, that's yeah. a dig at, at Michigan right there, Shu. I think you just do that in there so we can fall <laughs> off on Draymond. Twenty four percent from three point range. That's foul. That's foul. You doing Draymond? You had it. You set us up so we could bash Draymond. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is on the on the borderline? Shoe. I mean, it's got to be. Are they the only teams in the playoff mix that would have that kind of uh, dynamic in, the, in their score? Yeah. Well, let's see. Chicago is the third team that only has three guys. There's only three teams total that have three guys averaging. Chicago is is third one, but Chicago's often right. is absolutely awful. <laughs> <laughs> Denver has only four. Houston has only four. Philadelphia right. four, and San Antonio four. So there's means, like I said, the average is five per team. But uh, yeah, 
Yeah, my guy, my guy, Monte Moore has been over there tearing up this year, man. I've been. Man, Monte Moore's been balling. Yeah, I've been following yeah, yeah. him very closely, man. Yeah, I, man, I'm crazy story. I was back in Michigan, his senior year of high school. My niece was mm-hmm. uh, on the Michigan Scholar Athlete Program up at the Breslin. Yeah. And uh, so we went to the game to see, to watch her get honored. And Beecher was winning the state championship. And I was like, oh, yeah. this little point guard for Beecher is nice, you know. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't really see, I didn't know, I knew he was going to Iowa State, but I had no idea he would end up being an NBA player. I was like, man, yeah. you never know. Um, right. He's got you know, that guy who just kept grinding. He's got that like yeah. the most ridiculous assist to turnover ratio. I was talking to a scout yeah, about him, and I was like, "Yeah, that Monty, yeah, yeah Monty Morris." We were talking about the Nuggets. I'm like, oh, Monty Morris isn't bad. Like, what are they going to do when Isaiah Thomas comes back? Like, they already have a right. good backup point guard. <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, I remember watching Monty Morris. He had some string of like eight or nine games in college where he didn't commit a, a turnover." And I'm like, "Yeah, he got crazy. the he got the record. He got the NCAA record. Yeah, I've, I've been a." Uh... We call him Man Man back here, back back in uh back in Flint, man. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, man, I've been I've been following Man Man. He was uh I covered him, you know, from tenth grade all the way to college. So yeah, right. man, I'm 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 super proud of that dude and the work that he put in. You know, man, number one team in the Western Conference and coming from where he coming from, I covered his. Uh, I was at his draft party, you know, from not even knowing right. he was wow. drafted to, you know, to him and Cools, you know, Cools got forty one last night. So right, those guys, yeah, man, yeah. those guys are balling, man. I'm, I'm proud of those guys. Repping for Flint. Yeah. <laughs> man, just like you, we appreciate you. We, like I said, man, some some great stuff, man. You gotta, I think everybody needs to get out there and check out some of the stuff you've done um, on the Desert it, News man. website. This, the story with Carl Malone was crazy. Um, appreciate it, man. And I'm not even a Carl Malone guy, but I read it. I was like, I, I almost halfway like this dude now after all the years of being a Pistons fan and you know wishing bad things. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a crazy one, man. He, he definitely uh, just being there. Like I said, I didn't grow up a Malone fan or nothing like that either. So that was right. different, you know. For me, I'm I'm totally outside coming in, so it's not like I'm biased or anything. It was what I learned when I was there, so it was crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's what's up, man. Keeping it going, man. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll be we'll be checking you out, man. Hopefully, we see you down the road in the playoffs somewhere and uh, get a chance to you know chop it up. Yeah, definitely, man. I appreciate y'all, man. Keep up the good work. All right, thanks, thanks man. man. Okay, thanks. It's Eric Woody from the Deseret News Shoe. One of my, like I said, I'm biased. He's from Michigan. What you want me to do? I, 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 you know, I'm a homer. I'm a homer when it comes to people from the right state. So, what you want me to do? Devin Booker going to be on your uh, All Star ballot in uh, next week? Uh, MVP ladder tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, man, you got to show your true color, Shoe. You got to do what you got to do. You know how it is. Appreciate Eric Woody from the Deseret News joining us here, breaking down uh, the Utah Jazz a little bit on the Anytime Podcast. We'll be back Monday. With another episode, as always, uh, the latest Kia Race to the MVP ladder drops Friday on NBA.com. See, check it out. See who's in the number one spot. Is it Giannis this week or James Harden? I'm going to leave you guessing until you check it out on Friday. Be sure to subscribe to Hang Time on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts for new episodes all season long. For John Schumann, our producer, John Hartzell, the Seku Smith, we'll see you right here next time on the Hang Time Podcast.